he retired as an assistant chief of um, the Air and Wildfire Division. He currently is FSRI's, I'm going to say, operational manager. He implements the work that FSRI does, and that includes this investigation here. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, Dr. Kerber. Thank you very much, Attorney General Lopez. The Fire Safety Research Institute is very humbled to be able to lead this important analysis of the Lahaina Fire. Uh, we're also humbled to be able to release the Phase 1 report and timeline to the people of Hawaii and beyond. Before I get into the details, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about our organization. UL Research Institutes is a nonprofit safety science organization that has been working for a safer world for over 130 years. The Fire Safety Research Institute is one of five research institutes. We have a team of over 70 professionals and we're dedicated to understanding the world's unresolved fire safety risks and emerging dangers. We conduct research in many areas, uh, including firefighter health and safety, uh, fire investigation, uh, battery fire safety, fire dynamics and materials, and of course, wildland urban interface fires. We also, across all of these research areas, participate in a lot of investigations and analyses to better understand fire across all of these areas so that we can prevent incidents like this one from happening in the future. As Attorney General Lopez stated, this is broken up into several phases. And really the importance of that is to get information to the people of Hawaii in a timely manner and to be transparent about all of the facts and all of the components of the investigation. So as you can see here, um, when Attorney General Lopez contacted us, clearly we were paying a lot of attention to what was going on in Lahaina and really had the same question that she had. How is it possible that something like this could happen? So we were very interested following the details, uh, trying to understand, trying to figure out how we could apply our research knowledge uh, and what we've learned over the years on these subject matter areas, specifically structure to structure fire spread and the fire dynamics associated with a fast moving urban conflagration like this. And we certainly aligned on the two key aspects transparency and speed. Speed not at the detriment of accuracy, but in order to get things out in a very uh, quick timeline and to be openly available. The Lahaina Comprehensive Timeline Report, what we've referred to as phase one here, focuses on the events that occurred prior to, during, and immediately following the Lahaina fire things such as preparedness efforts, weather and its impact on infrastructure, and other fires occurring at the same time on Maui for the time period from 2.55 p.m. through 8.30 a.m. on the 9th. This phase does not include an investigation of the cause. The cause investigation will be conducted by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, and in partnership with Maui County. We have a long history with ATF. Uh, we've been their partner for several research projects. We've been their training partner in uh, teaching their new fire investigators fire dynamics. In our opinion, the ATF is the best cause and origin investigation organization that exists. So when AG Lopez and myself were discussing that, if we were to add to our team to do a cause and origin investigation, we would have called the folks at ATF that were involved. So we felt that it was important that we allow them to do their work, we don't duplicate efforts, and we take the results of their investigation of which they have briefed us on and we look forward to the release of their cause and origin investigation, but it does not have an impact on our phase one uh, that we're releasing today. 
So as you can see here, as we release phase one, we transition to phase two. Phase two is an analysis of the facts that we've gathered. We're going to examine all aspects of this tragedy to include the actions of responding organizations, the evacuation, how the fire protection systems operated, and many more aspects of this tragedy. Finally, in phase three, we're going to look forward. We're going to do a lot of work with the residents of Maui and the organizations there to see how we can prevent this from happening in the future. Applying understanding of best practices, principles, policies, procedures, and uh, really get into what we can do going forward. With that, to get into the process, I'm going to pass it over to our lead investigator, Derek Alconis. Thank you, Steve. The process of any investigation, or we call it a comprehensive analysis in this case, starts with gathering the facts. And what are those facts? Those facts consist of dispatch records, computer data dispatch records, communications that went on between the firefighters and the police officers. And so we made those requests via email to Maui County and started processing that information and dropping it into a timeline because you need to know the facts. That's the first part. We also reached out to Hawaiian Electric and had conversations with them and gathered information with them as well as well as all of the state agencies and other agencies or, or organizations that were involved in preparedness and response. We also were on site with our team starting in August and extending into November, walking the streets of Lahaina, documenting in detail the loss that was suffered, the structural damage, identifying potentially where we can analyze and identify where, you know, answer the question of why some structures survived and some did not. We wanted to understand the areas where lives were lost, understand the fire's progression through those areas, which required hundreds of pictures and videos on the ground, in, from the air, and even reaching out to residents, hundreds of residents, and talking with them about their experience, learning what they observed. And at times they would offer their images to us that were time stamped that we can drop into the timeline and so we can get a better understanding of the fire's progression. We also had these technical discussions with with firefighters, police officers that were on scene. And, and the state officials, elected officials, um, and, and others that we can make contact with to find exactly where the fire was at a particular moment and the actions of the responding agencies. I'm going to go through a few slides that are taken from the report itself and to give you some context of what's included in the report. So before the PM fire, which we call the Lahaina PM fire, that happened at 2.55, there was a lot going on. The area was subjected to very high winds that were forecasted by the National Weather Service. These winds were enough to topple utility poles, trees, rip roofs off of structures, and they created a challenge with the traffic going in and out of Lahaina. This picture here was taken at, at 9 o'clock, just after 9 o'clock, and you can see it's several hours before the Lahaina PM fire took off. And this is the traffic on Lahaina Luna Road coming westbound. And so the image is taken looking eastbound, and you can see those vehicles stacked up in line trying to go either north or south out of town. And the reason for that is because there was no power to, 
to control the traffic signals. There was blocked roadways getting in and out of Lahaina. This next slide with the image on the left, that's a Google Street View image taken in 2019. The structure is in place and that's Lahaina Luna Road, sorry, from Luakina, Luakini looking west. And so that image on the left there is where the structures are intact. You can see the power lines overhead. The one on the right was taken just about an hour before the Lahaina PM fire took off at 2.55. And you can see roofs are ripped from the tops of the buildings. Power lines are dangling. Egress routes are blocked. This was the challenge. So these winds that were forecasted came to light here. Um, as, as the infrastructure was damaged, as the buildings were damaged, and now the fire was raging, it created a, an opportunity for the fire to run very quickly through the community. I'll bring up Dr. Kerber to explain. key to the timeline is understanding how, why, and how fast the fire progressed. In the report, you'll see a detailed timeline of the fire's progression. Looking on the left here, beginning in the ravine area south of the Lahaina Intermediate School, based on resident video that was shared with us, you could see the fire move quickly over the bypass into the community driven by severe downslope winds. As it spread, it exposed many houses on both sides of Lahaina Luna Road and transitioned into an urban conflagration. In the report, we'll use a term wildfire initiated urban conflagration. This is really important in how we discuss this incident and how we understand how the fire progressed. An urban conflagration occurs when an abundant fuel load such as homes built in close proximity to nature and other homes, are ignited and become large, disastrous, and destructive fire that threatens life, health, and property. In this fire, the fire spread by three mechanisms. First, direct flame contact. As the grass was on fire, if the grass would lead right up to a home, the fire was able to transfer directly from object to object, so from the grass to a home, for example. The second fire spread mechanism is by radiation. Let's say that that house then caught fire. Just like you would sit around a campfire and warm your hands, if the energy coming off of that home was large enough, it doesn't have to touch another object to ignite it. That fire could jump from object to object with a gap between. And then finally, embers. This is so important to understand to see how quickly this fire spread. So as an object burns and it begins to come apart and it's influenced by both the fire plume itself as well as the wind, pieces or particles break off of the burning object, are able to be carried by the wind, and then deposit somewhere else and possibly ignite what we call a spot fire. So in this case, you could have very small, what would look like sparks, all the way up to pieces of houses that were carried by the wind on fire and able to spread the fire. And this could mean that you would have one house on fire and you might have another fire ignite several houses down or even a mile downwind from where the flame front actually was. And then this process repeats those embers will deposit, it will start a new fire, and that fire will either come into direct flame contact, will spread via radiation, or will produce its own embers and continue to cascade. So in this fire progression map that was built from the data from the fire department, the police department, their observations, their radio transmissions, resident 911 calls, photos and videos from residents, and really, this would not be possible 
if it wasn't for the contributions of those sharing that information, telling their story, and as Derek pointed out, what became critical to understanding how it grew and spread was the metadata that came with the photos and the videos. We saw all kinds of useful photos and videos on social media and other platforms, but without knowing when that photo or video was taken and where it was taken, it wasn't able to be put in context with the timeline that we were building. So really important that we were able to gather that information. And on the right-hand side, what I want you to see is an animation of the data to give you an appreciation of how the fire spread. So as I start that video, you'll see the fire quickly move towards the ocean to the west. That fire spread through the urban area, also moved south through the grass to other structures in the southern part of Lahaina. And then the fire spread across the grass to the north and westward through the Wa'akuli neighborhood to the ocean again. And then as time progressed from there, it spread to the perimeter, which you see is the outlined area in both of the maps. Uh, and you can see the general direction on the left at which it took. And this paints the picture and essentially the baseline of how that fire moved through the community. We will also share that animation so that people can really look at it in detail and, and break it down. Also in the report, this is one example of what you're going to see as a deep dive into all aspects of that fire progression. So every dot that you see on the map is a data point that will be explained and how it fits into the fire progression. Uh, you will also see the arrows indicating the general movement of the fire. In this case, it's a snapshot from 4.42 p.m. to 5.42 p.m. as the fire moved quickly to the west towards the ocean, over the highway, and ultimately with embers going over Kahoma Stream into the industrial area. These images here also give you an idea of what you're going to see in the report. These images show an example of a video shared by a resident that allowed us to see the timing of the fire moving from west down Como Mai Street at about 6.14 p.m. And it also shows the fuels that were in an important area that later in the timeline come into play as the fire moved uh, across Kiave Street towards the Wa'akuli neighborhood. This is one of many, many examples of visuals that are used to tell the progression story of the report, and each image is also accompanied with a diagram to orient you to where that was taken and where it was looking. I'll pass it back to Derek to talk about the response. Although there was many organizations and agencies involved in the preparedness and response to this fire, this report focuses on the time period of the most rapid fire progression, which ended the morning of the 9th. These organizations that you have on this slide here represent those who were most actively engaged during the response period. And in the, in the report, you will find detailed accounting of the fire department and every resource that responded and that we spoke with the firefighters that were there and got their experience and documented that. And all of that is included in the report, pretty much minute by minute. As well as the police department and all of their efforts toward evacuation and even rescue. So many accounts of both police and firefighters rescuing individuals from areas that they would have been in certain peril. And the organizations such as Maui Emergency Management Agency, the detailed accounting of, of their actions are included in this report, as is the private heavy equipment operators who work side by side with the firefighters to, to, to clear away um, uh, fuel areas or 
um, deliver water um, using their water tankers. And then also HIEMA, the, air, uh, the aircraft rescue units, um, Hawaiian Electric and their actions, those are included in the report. And so you'll find that there is a lots of detail in that, in that section. So in summary, the report is 375 pages. It's a narrative. It describes the background of the area. It goes over what was done in preparedness of this type of event, how organizations were staffed in preparedness of the event. And then it goes into the actual response. And it takes it through to that morning of the ninth. Now it also includes a, a very detailed timeline that consists of about 12,000 rows of data in an Excel spreadsheet. So what we've done is taking, taken the data that has been gathered from all the organizations, those that have timestamps, and loaded, loaded those into an Excel spreadsheet and sorted by time. So now you can look at 1,800 hours and find out what was going on at that time. What were all the different organizations doing at that time? What were some of the decisions made? What was being communicated on the radio? What was being communicated using um, other tools from the EOC? You'll be able to, to learn of that in that from, from the um, timeline. So this report is designed, too, to be useful to everybody, to organizations that want to study this further, to residents, whoever may want to learn from this event and move forward. We feel like it's, 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 in, it's organized in a fashion that, that you can use it to um, identify your own recommendations of what needs to happen. And we'll be doing the same. Now, I will say that what this report doesn't capture is the loss, the people, the challenges that they've gone through, the pain, the sorrow. And some of those things will be analyzed later. But you need the facts first. That's the most important part right now. So I'll turn it over to A.G. Lopez. Um, so at this point, we will take questions. I'll take them in order of hands. I saw uh, Jonathan first, then Gina, Paul, and then we'll go from there. And remember, there's a microphone. It's right behind you, Jonathan. My question is for A.G. Lopez, Jonathan Bigliotti with CBS News. In the immediate aftermath of the fire, we heard from county officials saying that their resources were stretched then beginning early in the morning. But as the report makes very clear, according to investigators, Mayor Bisson uh, denied and declined help from the state multiple times, even declaring an emergency. The state even warned that they may do so over him. Does this amount to negligence? I'm going to focus on the purpose of this report. I am not commenting at this time on the actions of anybody. This phase one is so that we can understand what happened on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. How, how people acted, how government responded is, uh, whether we were successful or not, is what happens in phase two. And I want to be clear. The, the purpose, the underlying foundation of this report is not to place blame on anybody. This is about never letting this happen again. And that is my focus and will continue to be my focus. 
Gina Mangieri, KHON2 News. Um, in the interviews and the technical discussions that are in this report with Herman and Daya and with the mayor and others, who would have done those interviews, number one? And number two, what was your takeaway from that? We heard in advance of the release of this report much about having to subpoena to get information, that there seemed to have been a lack of willingness. When the interviews and technical discussions took place with Herman and Daya and with the mayor, how was the demeanor, the responsiveness, and the amount of information that you got back from them? I'll let Dr. Kerber and Mr. Alconis answer. So the, the interviews with some of the elected officials and Herman and Daya, those took place in, um, with members of our team who had experience in, in that line of work or, um, and also uh, with the um, with the focus on gathering as much information as possible from their decisions. And so we asked decisions related to how they engaged in, in the incident, um, both from a preparedness perspective and a response perspective. Um, we asked the questions, they provided the answers at times they couldn't recall, and they would say that. Uh, who was next? Um, Paul, you were next, and then Daryl, and who else wanted to ask a question? A yeah. Ashley, and then Stuart. Yeah. Okay. A couple of questions regarding some of the data. You, you mentioned or you showed the animation. Any idea on how fast this fire spread at its quickest? And I know that as you look through and we, we saw for, from the area, there were some areas that weren't as impacted by the fire. I know that's going to come out in phase two, but can you talk at least a little bit about what was going on with that fire? Yeah, so the the fire absolutely progressed very quickly. To put a time on it, I mean, you, you will have point by point uh, ability to see how it moved and spread, but uh, looking at it from a big picture perspective, we saw spot fires at the ocean front within an hour, within about 90 minutes. So uh, traveling over a mile in about 90 minutes is incredibly fast. And uh, you'll also see areas that burned and areas that did not burn, which will be an important part of phase two is, is understanding why. But you'll clearly see, as we talked about how embers work and how ember movement works, it allows the fire to jump. And another aspect that will be part of phase two is the role that the fire department played, the residents played, the police officers played, in stopping fire progression. Uh, a number of efforts will be easily explained once you see the structures that are left and why they were left remaining. Uh, also, when you guys uh, ask your question, say who it is that you want to talk to. Uh, who is next? I'm sorry. Uh, Ashley. Ashley. Okay. Uh, I think this is for Attorney General. Um, you know, in the report, you talk about, you know, Maui County not wanting to uh, receive emailed requests anymore and instead subpoenas. Were they cooperative up until that November date, sending you back information via the email requests? And, you know, what specific information were you requesting right before they said they would like to be subpoenaed instead? When we initially started, um, Derek and Steve and that team was working, were working directly with the county employees through the Corporation Council. At some point, and I'm not going to speculate as to why, because of perhaps the um, number of requests and the, the breadth of the data being requested, I believe that they asked for subpoenas so that they that would help them figure out how to structure their responses and what they were doing. Um, we also, they also asked then for subpoenas with respect to all of the interviews. I'm not sure I remember the rest of your question. The, the beginning part was if they had been responsive before asking, were you getting information back via email? We were getting some back. Hi, um, my name is Stuart Yurton. I'm with Civil Beat here in Honolulu. Uh, this would be for Dr. Kerber. The report uh, on the spread of the fire mentions that the morning fire was extinguished 
by a certain time, late morning. Uh, and then the afternoon fire started later. So it refers to two fires. But we're hearing a lot about embers spreading, maybe causing the fire to spread. So can you unequivocally say there were, in fact, two separate fires? Or was the afternoon fire possibly caused by embers from the morning fire? So what we can say is that we know the fire department stated that the fire was extinguished by telling Central or the dispatch uh, affirmative when asked the question at about 2.17 p.m. And we know that the second was dispatched at 2.55. So we know those timestamps. Uh, as far as what caused or what happened between the two, that is for the ATF cause and origin investigation to share. Um, to follow up on that, Daryl Huff from Hawaii News Now. These two fires, though, were in how proximate were they to each other? So we, we do know the extent of what we call the AM fire and the location where it was based on reports of, of everyone involved. And then our first data point after the fire was dispatched is a resident video that was driving from north of the area. So they were driving west on Lahaina Luna Road and we have a video showing smoke coming from the area near where the ravine would be behind the homes across from the Lahaina Intermediate School being moved towards the ocean via the wind. Uh, so we do have confirmation around that time approximately where the fire is. Uh, that does not include a specific origin of exactly where it was. That will be for the ATF to include in the report. In your report, you mentioned the exact same cul-de-sac, the exact same uh, streets as being where these two fires had burned. And when the fire department returned to the scene a little bit after 2.55 in the uh, afternoon, it was a 10-foot by 100-foot fire at almost exactly the same place as the prior fire. Is there any way that those fires would not have been generated originally by the same fire in the morning. So the information that you saw in the report is absolutely correct. Um, I'm not going to get into whether or not it was the same. It was absolutely in the same area. Uh, yeah, this question's for Dr. Kerber. Sorry, man. No worries. Uh, no my name's Peter. I'm with the Honolulu Star Advertiser. You mentioned that you were briefed on the ATF's findings so far. Where are they in that investigation? What kind of a time frame are they letting you guys know that they're going to share their entire report with uh, the Maui Fire Department? And then the follow-up to that would be, how difficult is it to perform this type of analysis and, and you know, after action look at, at, what, at government's response when we, when we don't know where the fire started, how it started, you know, all that sort of data. How key is that to completing this? And what sort of timeline are you working with? Sure. So the... The first question there around the ATF interaction, um, before we, or when we got to Lahaina to begin the analysis, uh, they were very open to explaining where they were in their process, uh, roughly where the origin was and what, how they believe the fire began to progress because that really helped us anchor the beginning of our investigation. Because from the beginning, it was very clear is our investigation will essentially pick up where theirs left off. Um, that's where our expertise begins. Theirs is in the, the cause and origin. Uh, we've had a number of conversations since. Uh, we made sure that they had the data. If, if they were to need any data from us, that we make it available to them. Um, and the last I heard from their engineers is they're working very hard uh, to get it done. I think the, I mean, they absolutely want to have something public, I think, by the anniversary of the fire, by the one-year anniversary. Uh, we'll see whether or not they can, they can meet that or not, because their challenge is, is much like ours, talking to the second point of your question. This is an incredibly complex fire. Um, it was very fast moving, and even things like the fact that the power was out to much of the area 
meant that things like security camera footage or other things that we might normally see as part of other investigations weren't available. Uh, there was not good satellite coverage in this particular area. So whereas in some of their investigations you might see satellite thermal image of how the fire progressed, we didn't have any of that. So we had to rely on the residents. We had to rely on the firefighters, the police department, all of the responders to share their stories and any piece of information that could possibly help piece the timeline together. Um, what you'll see in the report is essentially the outcome of that process. Uh, you will see every single data point. You will have every single lat long and time and what data is associated with the description of that data point. Uh, it's been, uh, takes a lot of detail and, and a lot of effort and I'm incredibly proud of the effort that our team has put in to date, and uh, there's a long way to go. Oh. Hi, this is Jennifer Kelleher from the Associated Press. I um, was hoping you could talk a little bit about the communications breakdowns and how that sort of contributed to um, officials seemingly being on different pages or in the dark, or, and also for the Attorney General Lopez, what stood out to you the most, what was particularly shocking or surprising, and if you could provide an update on how much this has cost so far um, in terms of the investigation, when, what has been paid so far to FSRI. Thank you. So I'll start with the communication piece, and we'll just say that uh, communications is a tremendous challenge for any complex incident like this. Uh, to the extent of which it's difficult will be a part of the phase two analysis. Uh, but what you have to look at in the current report is all of those communications or any timestamp communications uh, that we had that were able to paint the picture of uh, who, what people were doing and, and when they were doing it. Okay, so we also have some questions online. Um, the second piece for the hmm? attorney Jennifer general. Had another oh, you had a second, sorry about that. Yes. I was checking with uh, Dr. Kerber to make sure I, I knew um, what the contract amount was at at this point. The initial contract was for a year and uh, the not to exceed amount was $1.5 million. We are a little bit delayed. We're behind the schedule that I had originally put forth and so we will be extending the contract for another year. and. Uh, I'm not sure if we've actually come up with what the uh, extended not to exceed amount will be. I, I, I can make that available when we do, though. What surprised me the most as I was talking, I, I didn't know a lot about fire on August 8th. Um, after working with and talking to um, the folks at FSRI, what I have found most astonishing through this is how the hurricane winds, the clouds, um, the dryness and the humidity, how all of that came together. And I know this sounds perhaps trite, but the perfect storm. It, it truly appeared to be all of those things together. and. Uh, I, I didn't know the three ways that fire gets transmitted, um, but now knowing about those ember showers and winds that are 80 miles an hour and how far they could push the embers made, made me really understand in a different way how this fire could spread. The other thing I'll say is that when you read the communications and the, the radio talk between firefighters and police officers, you, you can only come away with the understanding that these folks risk their lives for hours, saving people and trying to prevent people from dying. Um, when you read it, it will, it will hit home very clearly that those firefighters and police officers are heroes, um, and, and we should recognize that. Okay, so we also had some questions online. Wendy Osher with Pacific Media Group. Um, she does say it's for A.G. Lopez, but I believe it's actually for one of you guys with uh, FSRI because it is asking about a section of the report. It says, under the section of mayoral communication with Maui Emergency Management Agency, there was 
uh, there's a quote that says, there was no reliable communication other than public safety radio. Given the information revealed so far, are there any takeaways regarding communication and how to improve response and situational awareness in the future? I think this is in reference to the communications from the EOC to um, the HIEMA and other organizations that were monitoring the incident. Um, yes, you'll find in the report that there is uh, a, a difficulty with gaining information from the EOC. Um, you'll read about that in the, uh, in the section that, uh, that addresses the EOC and HIEMA. And there is, um, the, in terms of the reason for that challenge, that's going to be analyzed in subsequent reports. But these are just the facts. So we have another question online that's going to be for you, too. Uh, it's from Steve Patterson with NBC News. It says, on page 241, oh. it is noted that while other agencies good, good submitted here. ICS forms, they were noted as not submitted from Maui Emergency Management Agency. How many times did you request the info? Uh, how many times, or why was it denied or ignored? And what do you hope to learn from that data? This information from the, uh, this, this is from the EOC and uh, MEMA Form 214s, I believe. And that's correct. We have limited information from the EOC from MEMA, um, but we do have some, and we have made multiple requests for that information. Um, we have just in the past few months, we received some logs from those people who were in the EOC. That was after um, interviews that we discovered that there was some information that was to be learned from some logs. Um, and that's where we gained that information from. Okay, was there anyone else who didn't have a question already in the group here? Okay, we have uh, one final question for, it says for Attorney General Lopez. Um, did the AG determine if firefighters shouldn't have left the scene of the morning of the Lahaina fire? That is not a determination that my office will be making. I engaged FSRI because they are the scientists who can understand these um, situations. And that's the last question that we have. Uh, we have about one more minute left. Um, Gina, I know you had your hand up. One last question, and then we will wrap it up. No, Thank you. Too long. I mean, this is a huge report. Why are you limiting time? We can ask questions. This um, is the day after the fire. This is deja vu. You guys really should be open. If you've got to close off your feed, that's one thing. But so, just to say, everybody gets one question, by that's exactly what happened the day after the fire that got everybody so mad. So I really, please, continue to answer questions. Understood. Do you know you can go ahead and ask your question? Gina Mangieri, K212 News. I know that for this report, um, Attorney General, you mentioned it's not, this is not the blame assessment or that, but will you continue to pursue this? We see whether it's in the mayor's t t technical discussion or with Herman and Daya, there appears to be times when the shot callers made at minimum a bad call or underestimated the extremity of what was about to hit or potentially could have gone into negligence. Will you be looking and will you follow up on everything from negligence to civil, civil to either criminal liability, should any exist. We're going to continue this investigation, and we will follow it wherever it leads. Okay. There was one last question online. It was to ask about the firefighters, the emergency responders, and the response overall. There was a lot of miscommunication in the media, and they wanted to hear a little further about what it is that um, what you actually determine. So, all that, yeah. What's the, what's the question? It's not, it, they wanted to know further, let me find it, if the, there was a miscommunication, it seems, about the response of the first responders, and they would like to hear a little bit more about that. So in, in the report, you'll see a minute-by-minute -minute analysis of what every single responding unit did during the time frame within the report from the 255 on the 8th through 0830 on the 9th. It's broken down by every single responding unit um, and you'll be able to see all the actions that they took. Once we get into the analysis, we'll be looking at how does that pertain to best practice and 
we'll be able to look at the fire progression along with all of the responding units actions and that's really what the analysis is is looking at these cross-cutting data sets to put them together to get a much better picture of why they did what they did and uh, how that compares to what we believe to be best practice through our expert team okay with that said that was the final question we have uh, attorney general lopez would you like to get up and say some closing remarks attorney general lopez i would like to ask one more question i'm sorry I would like to respond, um, Daryl, to what you said earlier. What I would like is for people to unpack this report. It is truly 12,000 lines on a spreadsheet and a 400-page report. What I would love uh, is for everybody to unpack that, talk about it, think about it, and I will be more than happy to uh, come before you again so that we can have that conversation. Steve and Derek won't be here, but I feel confident we can find a way to interview them as well uh, through Zoom or something. So I, I, these questions have to be answered, and I need I I will be accountable for that, Daryl. I just would like people to become more knowledgeable. This conversation is that most of us have read the report. We have questions based on reading the report, and that's why I feel like you should continue to answer. I appreciate that comment. Okay, thank you, everybody. That ends our news conference. If you have any questions for me, feel free to email me or call me with that. Thank you. Thank you.